Welcome back. For the ninth time in over 50 years, the earnings yield on the S&P 500 has gone below that of the three month treasury bond. Today, we will look at the historical data on how the market tends to react shortly after such an event happens, why this happens and what we may expect to happen in the future based on this data. What are these components and what do they mean? The earnings yield is similar to the dividend yield, which I've covered on this channel in the past. The dividend yield is the proportion or percentage of the stock price given back to shareholders in the form of dividends. Calculated by taking the dividends per share, divided by the share price and multiplied by 100. The earnings yield is simply the proportion of the most recent per share earnings of a company divided by the share price. It can be considered the inverse of the PE ratio, so I guess we could call it the EP ratio. Now this can be applied to a market index as a whole. Say the index is delivering $10 in earnings per unit in its most up-to-date earnings, and its current price is $200. The earnings yield is 10 divided by 200, multiplied by 100 to arrive at a 5% earnings yield. Some calculations, particularly for indexes, use an average or smooth earnings to help dilute the effect of any outlier years. The three-month treasury bond, commonly referred to as the risk-free rate, is the yield you can get for taking on no risk and consider the benchmark or minimum rate of return for investors. It is more or less controlled by central banks such as the Fed in the USA when they adjust the Fed funds rate. This will impact the amount of interest you pay on your mortgage and credit cards, the yield you get on your savings account, and what may be lesser known is it also impacts stock prices by affecting a key input in how an analyst values a stock. I've covered the risk-free rate and how it relates to valuing a stock in previous videos. In the eight times the S&P 500 earnings yield has fallen below the three month T-bill rate since the 1960s, every single time has signaled a considerable drawdown in the market has been around the corner. To rationalize this, when a risky asset such as a basket of stocks represented by the market index, in this case the S&P 500, has less earnings yield than that of the risk-free asset, we can see how this might be dangerous. Why take on the added uncertainty and risk of owning a stock when a T-bill should yield more? To add to this, an investor looking to deploy their capital in a risky asset such as a market index should aim to purchase when earnings yields are high and conversely when PE ratios are low. This means you are buying stocks when they are cheap. To understand the chart a bit better, there's three main inputs. The yield on the T-bill, which is a proxy for the federal funds rate, the price of the index and the earnings on the index. An increase in stock price while the funds rate and earnings remain flat will cause the line to go down. An increase in earnings while the price and funds rate are flat will cause the line to go up. And an increase in funds rate while the price and earnings remain flat will cause the line to go down. Here's the nominal S&P 500 earnings yield going back to 1935. The long term average is about 5%. There were extreme times such as the Great Depression when earnings yields spiked to between 20 and 30% depending on how the earnings yield was smoothed for that period. To put that into perspective, for every $100 of S&P 500 shares bought during this period, those businesses were producing about $20 of profit per year. One can only imagine how it really felt investing during those times, but having a value mindset during that period Things may have looked fantastic to own corporations at that moment, as you could buy yourself a very large amount of profit generating businesses for a cheap price. And of course, on the other end of the spectrum, such as the period we're entering now and the numerous times that this signal has flashed since the 50s, the less interested we may be in owning the index because you're purchasing less earnings relative to the price and there's less value there compared to other periods. And zooming in a bit to the last 20 or so years, we can see how, barring the GFC, the earnings yield has coiled into a range of between about 3.7 and 6%. This is where the other part of the signal comes into play by looking at the federal funds rate, which will dictate the yield on the three month T-bill and impact company earnings if they hold debt. Over the last 15 or so years before 2022, the Fed funds rate has been near rock bottom since the GFC. As I'm sure we can all remember from the recent past, the cash you would receive from savings in your bank has been near 0%. As such, when we look at the earnings yield minus the cash rate, the very low yield set by central banks has incentivized investors everywhere to look for more risky assets just to beat inflation and earn a real return. And the abnormally low funds rate has made the earnings yield look relatively cheap and attractive. 
Of course, over the last 18 months or so, we can see how all of this has changed rather quickly, as the Fed is fighting to curb inflation by raising the funds rate and consequently increasing the three-month T-bill yield. Thus, with the earnings and stock price remaining relatively flat during that period, we find a dip in the chart up until the present moment. Investors seem yet to catch up with this fact. The macro landscape is changing and valuations remain high relative to earnings in spite of an increasing funds rate, with the 10-year rolling earnings yield at a level not seen since the dot-com bubble. We all know how that ended. With this relatively fast increase in the funds rate and the market and earnings remaining relatively buoyant throughout this period, we find ourselves for the ninth time since 1950 at a level where the yield on cash is greater than the earnings yield of the market. Historically, this hasn't fared very well in the short term when this happens. By now, you're probably aware of the market average returns of about 10% per annum, and with that, we can extrapolate the returns in time periods less than that here. So following an inversion like the one we're seeing in the market, how does the market tend to perform afterwards? Following such a signal, the three-month median S&P 500 forward return is basically 0%, with the market typically having negative returns when we look outwards between 6 to 12 months. This contrast is stark compared to the historical average returns of the market. The next port of call would be to dissect each of the preceding 8 episodes and determine which of these are the most similar to what we're facing today. The best way to categorise these would be to look at the episodes where this happened during a period when the Fed was raising rates versus periods in time when the rates were relatively flat. In five out of the eight times, the Fed was raising rates substantially, similar to what we're seeing today. And the other three times were when the Fed wasn't raising short-term rates. So considering the Fed is raising rates today, let's look at those five instances first. In each of those instances, the Fed was raising rates to combat inflation, and as such, the earnings yield on the S&P 500 dipped below the yield on cash, as the market did not react to this immediately. In three out of five times, the market rather quickly began selling off with the minimum peak to trough drawdown of about 20% over the next two or so years. Two out of the five times, the market went slightly higher, such as during the euphoria of the dot-com bubble, but ultimately that caused the greatest drawdown of the sample of about 50%. The average of these five samples was approximately a 31% drawdown peak to trough within about two years after the signal occurring. Now the other three signals were markedly different to what we're experiencing today, with the Fed not making significant changes in the cash rate. In these cases, the earnings yield went negative relative to the return on cash, not because the Fed was raising rates, but because the prices of the S&P 500 was simply rising faster than earnings. However, there were fairly immediate drawdowns following this signal during these three episodes, albeit a lot more dampened than the other five in terms of magnitude and duration. Now, of course, it must be noted that nothing is guaranteed. And while this signal has proved to be accurate in the past, we cannot discount the fact that every episode is different. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. For example, the 1999 signal during the dot-com bubble was a period in which asset prices were rising violently, but it ultimately took about 18 months after the signal occurred before the market took an equally violent reversal. There are similarities that could be drawn from that experience and the one we're seeing now. As many know, the S&P 500 is composed of many large tech companies with companies parading the term artificial intelligence or AI and the market becoming very optimistic about the consequences of this technology on earnings and stock prices alike. This narrative seems to be eerily similar to the one we saw back then, where all a company had to do was mention any derivative of the term internet and it would send its stock price parabolic. The last thing I want to talk about is the idea of a forward-looking market. Events such as interest rate decisions and company earnings can be relatively predicted in advance of them happening. Right now, the narrative seems to be that of a soft landing with a mild or even no recession on the cards, growing company profits and a pause and even a decline in the Fed's fund rate over the next several quarters. If some or all of these things were to occur, this could prove to be an invalid signal and we may not get the drawdown that we expect based on past data. In any case, if you're an active investor, I hope this signal is used only as a supplementary tool to your analysis and not some sort of market timing miracle. As I've stated before, I find active stock picking to not be worth the time or energy. 
and I deploy a larger proportion of my capital into passively managed index tracking funds in case my active plays turn out to be horribly wrong. This video was based on a video I saw on a fantastic channel called Game of Trades, who can fortunately afford a lot more fancy graphics than I can, and I encourage you to check them out for more thoughtful analysis of the market. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch the video this far. I hope it's been an informative video. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.